Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the second day of, of the workshop. My job this morning is to introduce our, uh, our keynote speaker for today, uh, and it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, Ewan MacDonald, who's the head of the Office of the Pacific in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, some commentator recently described Ewan as the Australia's Pacific Tsar, <laughs> apparently, um, which is, a, I'm sure it's a very apt description. Uh, Ewan's had a very distinguished career uh, in, uh, in the public service, uh, both in Victoria and uh, in, uh, in Canberra. Uh, before his current job, he was Australia's High Commissioner uh, in New Zealand. Uh, he was a Deputy Secretary in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade before that, and a uh, uh, Deputy Director General of OSE uh, prior to that. Um, so I think without further ado, Ewan, I uh, will invite you to, um, dare I say, step up to the podium. Well, good morning, uh, everybody, and thanks, James. And uh, he sounds like he's in good form, James, this morning, doesn't he? So, um, but uh, it's great to be here, and can I start by um, acknowledging uh, the traditional custodians of the land we meet on, the Ngunnawal people, and pass on my respects to their elders past and present and emerging, and extend uh, that respect to other Aboriginal and Tor Torres Strait Islander people here this morning. So, uh, so as James said, um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here at the Australian National University and its College of Asia and the Pacific. Uh, the college itself plays an important role in ste steeping our next generation of foreign policy practitioners in the history, challenges and opportunities that face our region. And I'd like to thank Michael Wesley uh, for arranging or convening this uh, workshop. Um, and I also wanted to particularly thank James, who, uh, of course, I worked very closely with over a long period. And I must say it was one of the most enjoyable parts of my career, not only because of James's uh, great sense of humour, which you've just seen, but also just his expertise and knowledge in the Pacific and his excellent judgment on key issues. So for me, uh, it's a great pleasure to come along at his invitation. And uh, he actually invited me to do this uh, almost before I'd started. In fact, before I'd started, I was still in my previous role uh, when I committed to this. So that was the very first thing uh, I really committed to do. So I was very keen uh, to make sure that I honoured that invitation. Um, but of course, for Australia, and it's great to see Colin just come in, given I've been uh, recently at the, in the Solomon Islands, uh, as you know, Colin, so it's great to see you here. Um, but of course, our close engagement with the Pacific, of course, stretches back a long time. And I've just returned, as I said, from a terrific visit to Solomon Islands in Fiji. Uh, firstly, accompanying the Prime Minister and the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Alex Hawke, uh, during their discussions with uh, Prime Minister Sogavari and, uh, and many of his ministers, uh, as well as, of course, the trip the Foreign Minister did this week to Fiji, where we, uh, we spoke to uh, the Prime Minister there as well, uh, together with other ministers, uh, Attorney General uh, and others there as well. So both those trips have been very good from my point of view. But I suppose the, one of the most significant things is these international visits, the first by both the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister in this new term, happened less than a week after they were sworn in, after Cabinet was sworn in. And the visits, in my view, are a clear demonstration of the government's and, and the Prime Minister's commitment to our region. And as our pr Prime Minister would say, uh, if you're going to step up, you show up. And uh, I'm sure you're aware the Prime Minister has already announced he's looking forward to attending the PIF in August, uh, just a few months away in Funafuti. 
and I'm pleased that the ANU and those here today share a similar commitment to our region. It's important from my perspective. Now I'm sure that with that commitment comes a pretty substantial depth of knowledge, so I won't cover <coughs> what will have been discussed already about the region's opportunities and challenges. I do, however, want to emphasise that what is happening today, this step up, builds on what has been a strong history of genuine partnership. Through decades of sustained engagement, Australia and the Pacific have forged a special and close relationship. Whether we are talking of the regional assistance mission to Solomon Islands, our enduring support for Pacific nations to host free and fair elections, responding to the devastation of cyclones, or developing disaster resilience capabilities, Australia's been there. We are a founding member and active participant in a range of key regional organisations, including the Pacific Community, established in 1947 as the South Pacific Commission, the Pacific Islands Forum, established in 1971, and of course we're a major funder, and its Forum Fisheries Agency, established in 1979. And we've also been at the heart of the Pacific region's trade and economic architecture, setting up regional agreements like SPARTECA, is that how you pronounce it? SPARTECA. Spartica. Yeah. It's a long acronym. <laughs> uh, South Pacific Regional Trade and Economic Cooperation Agreement, duty-free access to Australia and New Zealand for regional products, and PESA, uh, of course, in 2002. And I think that represents a fairly solid foundation and building on Australia's consistent track record as the region's largest development partner, Australia's Pacific Step Up was announced by then Prime Minister Turnbull in 2016. Our 2017 foreign policy white paper then pledged that Australia would engage in the region with even more intensity and ambition. And in November last year, Prime Minister Morrison committed to further step, out, step up our engagement in the Pacific. This was reinforced in the 2019-20 budget, uh, which will deliver $1.4 billion in development assistance to the Pacific over the next uh, year, financial year, and of course that's a record spend uh, for the region. And the Pacific Step Up is a commitment to ensure our a region is front and centre in our outlook. To achieve this, how we as a government work can be as important as what we do. And an important element of the office that I head is just that, how we work uh, with the Pacific. At the Prime Minister's direction, we set up the office of the Pacific within DFAT to drive implementation of our regional activities consistent with the regional and country priorities. The office now includes staff, from the Department of Foreign Affairs, but also alongside secondes and transfer, transfers from Department of Defence, Home Affairs, Environment, Finance, Treasury, AFP, Agriculture and Water Resources, Attorney Generals and Health, as well as from Infrastructure and Project Finance Agency and the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, and with more to join shortly. The Prime Minister is convinced, and I agree with him, that to truly step up in the region, we must speak with a common, <coughs> respectful and coordinated voice across government. Building those relationships and strengthening that coordination across government is at least half of my job. The other half is about listening to and engaging with and involving the Pacific countries in the design, implementation, and monitoring of our new programs. In my role as head of the Office of the Pacific, I'll be spending as much time in the Pacific as I do in Canberra, listening, collaborating, and making sure that our co collective effort is hitting the mark. I've already travelled to the region with our Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, former Assistant Minister for International Development, and the Pacific and the current Minister for in International Development of the Pacific and that's just in the first half of this year. And I've also travelled with New Zealand Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters 
to Fiji, Tuvalu and Kiribati. In fact, at a quick count in the last few months, I've uh, visited Vanuatu three times, uh, Tuvalu three times, Fiji four times, and the Solomon Islands three times. Um, and I have to say, the response from counterparts of mine in the Pacific to our increased step up has been very positive and enthusiastic. My role, of course, also includes consulting widely with experts such as yourselves, both in Australia and across the Pacific. We recognise that we do not have all the answers and value the opportunity to learn from your collective expertise and creativity and knowledge. The Step Up is an ambitious task, as well as the headline initiatives announced last year. It encompasses a new way of working across the breadth of our bilateral and development programs. This is driven by a recognition that we need to do more to support our Pacific partners to develop and thrive and to ensure our region is stable, secure <coughs> and prosperous. I won't be able to outline all the aspects of our work across the Pacific, so let me just touch on a few of the ways we work, the ways we are working to deliver on Pacific priorities. Late last year, as you know, we joined our Pacific partners in signing the Boyd Direct Declaration on Regional Security to an expanded concept of security encompassing elements of both environmental and human security. The Boyd Declaration clearly articulates many of the challenges facing our region from climate change to cyber security. The government is committed to working in partnership with our region to address them. Of course, a stable and resilient security environment provides a platform to achieve the region's sustainable development aspirations. These aspirations and challenges are, of course, not uniform across the Pacific. Each Pacific Island country is unique and the region's diversity is one of its great strengths. This is why we work both bilaterally and regionally to address the specific needs and priorities of each Pacific nation. Let me turn to some specific examples. The Boyd Declaration recognised climate change as the single greatest threat to the livelihoods, security and well-being of Pacific peoples. Australia will continue to work to improve environmental security across the re region. In careful consultation with our Pacific partners, we will deliver on our $300 million four-year regional assistance package to build climate and disaster resilience. And I know we're well over two-thirds uh, uh, across that expenditure. We're also rolling out a new $16 million package to address marine litter in our vast Pacific Ocean. And we also recognise the integrity and importance of Pacific Island leadership, which has been instrumental in increased global ambition to address climate change. We will work with our regional partners on Pacific-led climate initiatives, including through the Pacific Resilience Partnership, a regional coordination mechanism for resilient development. And Australia supports the partnership both financially, but also as an active member. And Australia will continue to mainstream climate and disaster resilience in our regional aid investments, including through our new Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, or AIFFP, uh, with an estimated $40 billion in infrastructure investment needed over the next decade, $40 billion. Debt financing is an important role to play in unlocking infrastructure support for the region's environmental and economic aspirations. Australia is committed to sustainable, principle-based infrastructure investment that upholds robust standards, avoids unsustainable debt burdens and targets the needs of nations of the region, as identified by them, and unlocks the potential of private sector investment in the region. The facility will apply a careful balance of grant and loan funding and look to promote climate resilient, sustainable, inclusive and private sector led economic development. We're looking forward to the facility opening for business next month. 
We were also working with our Pacific family to prepare for and respond to natural disasters. For example, when Cyclone Gitta hit Tonga in February 2018, Australia responded immediately. We deployed 135 tonnes of pre-positioned humanitarian supplies. We worked to get Tonga's electricity network online within six weeks. Australia doesn't just respond to nat natural disasters as they happen. We've also worked with the region for many years now to help them prepare for natural disasters. Developing these capabilities in advance of Cyclone Gitta allowed us to work with Tonga to enable Tongan people and their economy to get back on its feet as quickly and as effectively as possible. Looking beyond disaster preparedness and management, most of you will probably know that tomorrow is World Oceans Day. Pacific Island nations manage 20% of the world's oceans. And in my travels, I regularly hear of the critical role ocean security plays in regional prosperity and development. Through our Pacific Maritime Boundaries Project, we have long worked to assist Pacific nations secure their maritime boundaries by securing their rightful exclusive economic zones. <coughs> and we are implementing additional programs to help our regional partners tackle illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, no, what, what is known as IUU, in these zones, including coordinated engagement under Australia's $2 billion Pacific Maritime Security Program. Access fees pay, paid by foreign fishing vessels to Pacific Island countries amount to around $350 million US each year, but could be as much as 40% higher if IUU fishing was eliminated. Our community-based fisheries management program is working with regional organisations, national fisheries agencies and communities in Kir Kiribati, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu to develop capacity to manage coastal fisheries sustainability <coughs> and share learnings across the region. We're also developing ways of supporting the region to build its capacity to undertake the sort of security analysis that is critical to the realisation of the Boyd Declaration. For example, in close consultation with the region, we are establishing the Pacific Fusion Centre. The Pacific Fusion Centre will work with Pacific Island countries and regional organisations to aggregate and analyse security information and inform responses to security challenges across the region. The centre will also include analysts from the region and be another way for these analysts to gain increased experience. I said at the start of this talk that I would not rehearse familiar territory around the region's challenges, but there is one challenge that I really do want to emphasise, and that is the issue of regional gender inequality. The 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper recognised that severe gender inequality is a persistent challenge in the Pacific and undermine security. As I've said, our foreign minister now is Australia's minister for women. When traveling with Minister Payne in Fiji earlier this week, we visited the House of Sarah. Funded through the, our flagship Pacific Women Shaping Pacific Development Program, which James knows very well uh, from his time in Aussie, uh, the House of Sarah offers counseling support to survivors of violence and promotes greater awareness of gender inequality. This and other initiatives such as the famous Fiji's Women's Crisis Centre demonstrate a true commitment to addressing gender equality issues. It's no surprise that Fiji has become one of the highest performing Pacific Island countries in terms of women's political representation. Let me now turn to economic prosperity. At a time when uncertainty permeates the global economy, we are committed to better integrating Australia, Australian and Pacific Island economies. This will improve regional prosperity. The Pacific Agreement on Closer Economic Relations Plus, or PESA Plus, will be the first reciprocal regional trade agreement in the Pacific. We expect it to enter into force later this year. 
the agreement will open up new markets and opportunities for the Pacific as well as Australian businesses. Another strong new initiative is additional funding for EFIC, Australia's export financing agency. It will have an extra billion dollars in callable capital as well as a more flexible infrastructure financing power. Alongside the AIFFP, this will also encourage Australian business to engage and invest in the region. We've also expanded our Pacific Labor Scheme to all key <coughs> Pacific Island nations. And I know from my travel in the region this year, this has a huge, in, huge interest. Uh, and we're already having had this initiative start in November this year. There are already 38 Australian employees that have signed on and numbers are growing and interest is growing. The scheme gives the Pacific populations the opportunity to work in Australia for up to three years in a range of low or semi-skilled professions. This builds on the success of the seasonal worker program which generated over 144 million in net income gains to Pacific Island countries between 2012 and 2017. Let me turn to the work we're doing to strengthen people to people links. We are committed to building closer to people to people ties between Australia and the Pacific, including through our education partnerships. For example, earlier this year I had the chance to visit Takamba Bai Riki Primary School in South Tarawa in Kiribati. Australia funding has helped to ensure that the school sets a high standard in terms of its final finish. And during re recent talks with the Kiribati government, a senior official told us that a what, told us what a difference in morale and ambition the school brought to the community. Beyond this initiative, we'll continue to deepen our educational partnerships across the Pacific through the Enhanced Schools Linkages Program and expand secondary and vocational education opportunities. <laughs> As you will know, sport is also a major connection between Australia and the Pacific. We are friends on and off the field. And uh, being in Fiji this week, I was very much reminded about the, uh, the Sevens victory. Um, so they, uh, they were certainly on a high after that. We are working to deepen this common passion and support sport in the Pacific at both the grassroots and elite levels. And just last week, uh, in, in the Solomon Islands, or sorry, just earlier this week in the Solomon Islands, Prime Minister Morrison announced further funding for the Get Into Rugby Plus program, which will facilitate better grassroots access for women and young girls and boys uh, to rugby. And the Prime Minister also committed to provide Australian training opportunities for a number of Solomon Island athletes to prepare for the 2023 uh, Solomon Islands Pacific Games and I know Colin that's a, a big thing for the country and we're looking forward to supporting you uh, as you move towards that hosting in 2023. Foreign Minister Payne also announced in Fiji this week that Australia would establish an elite sports training initiative to assist Fiji athletes, athletes prepare for major international events. And we would love to see the Fiji Rugby 7 success repeated across sports and across communities. These are a small number of examples of our efforts to achieve the Pacific's vision for a region of peace, harmony, security, social inclusion and prosperity. But to achieve this vision, we must overcome the Pacific's wide-ranging and steep development challenges. No one country can meet these challenges alone. That is why we are committed to promoting Pacific regionalism and working with outside partners to support the region's interests. It is therefore good news that Australia is not the only country stepping up in the Pacific. It makes sense for Pacific countries to cooperate with a range of development partners. New Zealand has launched its own Pacific Reset, which I know very well from my former role. As members of the Pacific family, Australia and New Zealand share a vision for a stable, secure and prosperous region, and we are pleased to coordinate with them. And as I said earlier, uh, Winston Peters uh, invited me to participate with him in his cross-party visits to Polynesia and Melanesia this year. 
Beyond New Zealand, the US and Japan, as well as France, the UK, China and Indonesia are all active partners in the region. Our work in Papua New Guinea is an il illustration of how we engage with these partners to address uh, Pacific priorities. And you'll recall the partnership between the United States, Japan and New Zealand, Australia and of course PNG to connect 70% of PNG power by 2030. And of course at the moment only 13% of the country uh, has access to electricity and I think uh, when we think about we go home and we turn the lights on, we turn things on, we have electricity, uh, only 13% of PNG at this time has that sort of uh, access to ele electricity. We're also working with China in PNG, a malaria initiative, and this complements of course our broader efforts around health uh, and health security, including reducing TB uh, in the country's western province. In concluding, let me return to the theme for the workshop, the challenging geopolitics of the Pacific Islands. Australia remains very focused on, the stepping, on stepping up our efforts to deliver on the region's genuine needs. Our efforts are driven by the very real and unique needs facing our region. As I travel around the region, I hear an overwhelming message of pride from Pacific countries in their sovereignty and a determination to set their own priorities and realise their own ambitions. And I travelled recently uh, with the UN Secretary General uh, to Tuvalu, Funafuti, and he was struck uh, by the pride and the resilience within the country. Um, it was very striking uh, for him and having him visit the region I think was a fantastic uh, thing for us because until you actually see the region it's hard to actually get the feel for some of the challenges. And he went to Tuvalu, and he went to Vanuatu, and he went to Fiji uh, during that trip. And of course spent uh, time uh, at the Pacific Island Forum meeting. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, a, de a real determination uh, from Pacific Island countries to set their own priorities and realise their own ambitions. This sentiment, I think, is well captured in the Boy Declaration, which respects and asserts the right of every Pacific Islands Forum member to conduct, to conduct its national affairs free of external inter interference and coercion. That is why our step up is taking place in cons consultation with our Pacific partners in response to Pacific priorities and with the long-term interests of our Pacific family as our guiding principles. We will continue to provide sovereign Pacific nations with genuine choices in achieving their priorities, from security in all its many forms, to development, economic <coughs> prosperity, and of course, strong people-to-people -people ties. We always have engaged, we always will engage in the Pacific because we are part of the Pacific and have the best interests of our region at heart. So thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Deng Hua. Yeah, I'm from the Department of Pacific, uh, Department of Pacific Affairs, and my research large, uh, focuses largely on the trilateral aid cooperation, as you have mentioned in the malaria project in KNG. So, I'm grateful if you can elaborate a bit on the progress of the project, and also what are the main lessons from the from the first Australian-China uh, trilateral cooperation, and also any plans for future projects in the region. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Um, so that project's been going for a little while now um, and um, you know we can provide more detail after this on, on where it's exactly up to. Um, from my point of view, those relationships with others as I talked about, including China, so that's our first uh, uh, project together, but, but China's doing uh, projects with New Zealand in the region as well and others, and I see greater opportunity as we go forward to cooperate together. So the malaria project, which is incredibly important in PNG, was a good one for us to commence our first uh, work together. Um, and, you know, my, my um, plan on that is to have further discussions uh, with the new development agency, uh, Chinese development agency, about one of the other opportunities 
uh, can arise in the future uh, for us to cooperate together. Um, so we'll give you an update on how it's going, but the progress of that, from my point of view, is, is has been very positive. Yeah. Okay. Nick? Oh, then go across the room. Uh, Nick McClellan from Ireland's Business Magazine. Um, I'm wondering, is there a trend in the Australian surge into the region against multilateral organisations? What does the new institutions like the infrastructure facility and so on mean for relations with the World Bank and ADB? You know, the government said they won't, for example, fund the Green Climate Fund, which is well known as a body of you know, half the board is developing countries, half developed and so on. You know, the Prime Minister said in his Laverack Barrack speech that these are, you know, we want to do this with us leading. Um, and I wonder whether that's going to raise issues about relations with the United Nations agencies, with the ADB and so on, given these new institutions that have been created? Um, look, no, I, I, I don't think so. So from my point of view, in terms of AIFFP, we've been working very closely with the other multilateral organisations as we work up the design of the facility, but also where there's opportunities to partner together with those multilateral organisations. Um, so I suppose, uh, from my point of view, we will be making uh, decisions on who we cooperate with and who we work with based on what will pro uh, provide the best and most effective uh, outcome for our Pacific Island countries. Um, and I think, you know, um, whether we fund a multilateral organisation, whether we uh, provide that funding through a regional organisation or whether we provide that funding through a bilateral organisation will be something that we decide based on our discussions with those <coughs> countries and also where we think we can get the most effective uh, delivery of what we need to. Uh, so in relation to, to climate, for example, we are not diminishing our <coughs> expenditure in any way on climate. Right? We're just looking at where is the best mechanism for us to to get the best outcome for those countries. Uh, and likewise, we'll do with the AIFFP. Uh, A -I -F -F -P. So what we're looking for there is really sort of transformative projects in the country, and we're already having many discussions. I had uh, some this week uh, in Fiji about their thinking on their pipeline of activity. Uh, but this is going right across the countries. We had similar conversations in Solomon Islands, so there's a lot of interest uh, in that and then by partnering up you maximize the benefit together so you know I use the example of uh, the electricity in PNG that's between uh, the five countries equally you can see projects uh, that are going to include you know the ADB it's going to include a regional entity it's going to include us etc and we're all going to have a component of that project and I think that's the way you get the, the, the outcomes we're really looking for so yes, we will be continuing to work with multilateral organisations. We are big funders to the ADB and the World Bank and the like. Uh, so we want to maximise the benefit for the region. And I note through the World Bank, for example, the IDA increases in IDA funding uh, into the region was something that we actively pursue with others uh, to get the focus on the region. So I think within the multilateral organisations, we will constantly talk and advocate for Pacific Island countries and for this region uh, because, you know, there are many other challenges across the globe, so it's important our region is considered uh, as a priority in that. Thank, thanks for the question. Um, I think Tess has got the mic. So. I do, yeah. um, Thank you. you. My name's Tess newton Kane. Where are you, Tess? I'm here. Hello. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. My name is Tess Newton from TNC Pacific Consulting. Um, you mentioned the Boy Declaration a few times, and we heard yesterday that Australia is assisting countries in the region in developing their national security strategies, which are a requirement of the Boy Declaration. So, are you able to tell us how your office is contributing to the development of Australia's strategy to set under the Boy Declaration? Yes, yeah, so, so we will provide, uh, or we are providing, uh, where countries are asking for, you know, uh, supporting the development. Sorry, no, I'm asking how you're, how you're working to develop a national security strategy for Australia. How As a signatory to the Boy Declaration. 
Well, I think in relation to the national security uh, strategy for Australia, um, I've, I'm focused on the region at the moment myself. I'm not. Uh, so your office doesn't have a role in contributing to the development of we, that strategy we, in order for it to align with the Boyd Declaration? Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, Australia's position on that, that would be led by our security agencies, etc. Of course, would be involved in it, but I, I don't honestly know where that's up to. I'll be honest with you. I've been in the role a short time, but I will find out, and we will give you an answer on that. Uh, but we're certainly working with other Pacific countries. I'm aware of that because of the the time I've been in the role and who I've spoken, the countries I've spoken to on that. So I'll get an answer for you on Australia. Great. Um, Steve, up the back, and then we'll come down the front again. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'll make someone. All right, we'll take the mic there. Well, you've got it. Yeah. Uh, 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 Tim Haynes, I'm from uh, the US Indo Pacific Command. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Pacific Fusion Center is going to be created. Um, I was curious on where that's going to be located. And, and secondly, how is that going to uh, work with existing organizations such as the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Hawaii? Yeah, so um, the Fusion Center is. Uh, not yet operational and as yet there's no decision on the location of it that will that will happen uh, in the future uh, it will be as i said uh, in my uh, remarks it'll be about uh, initially sharing open source information uh, across the region building capacity analytical capacity in countries to look at that uh, so all those things will be looked uh, together as we establish it. Um, so uh, in terms of its interaction with other agencies, that will need to be worked through, but it is open source information. The best way of thinking about it is it's bringing a number of sources of information together so that it can be consolidated and it can be seen. So for example, uh, there might be... Um, there might be uh, a, a, a vessel that uh, is uh, illegal, uh, may, may be illegal fishing, maybe have other, uh, other illegal substance that it's carrying or whatever that's identified in one EZZ, EZ, and then moves into another. So part of it is being able to track and share that information. Uh, of course, what countries do with that is their, their own sovereign decision. Uh, but it's about just sharing the information. So this will evolve over time. Um, so I can't say what it'll look like and it's final uh, and it's finally complete. But the initial phase is about sharing that information and building capacity, analytical capacity in those countries. Steve Optimal from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. I'm here. Oh, yeah, hi. Oh, yeah. uh, <coughs> Great university in, in New Zealand. <laughs> so the, the, the reset and the step up <coughs> came at the same time. And I noticed that you uh, also had discussions with uh, uh, a Mr. Foreign Affairs. Uh, mentioned his name yes. recently. Yeah. So uh, I was wondering whether uh, in the process of framing the two, the reset and step up. Was there some discussion? Was there a synchronization of the dance moves around the Pacific to make sure that you uh, uh, perhaps share different division of labor around the Pacific uh, and you don't step on each other's toes? Um, so, or were they designed individually without any consultation or because <coughs> yeah. it's no coincidence that they came out together at the same time. Was there a grand plan behind it? Both of them, uh, in your informal talks with, uh, uh, you know, on both sides. Yeah, this is a question. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, uh, in terms of the reset, you know, where were we done together? No, no, they weren't. Right. So, Winston Peters announced the reset, as you know, in New Zealand when I was still there as the Australian High Commissioner, and it. Uh, was a, it was an, in, a, a, you know, and he articulated why that was important from New Zealand's point of view, 
terms of stepping up and it, it was the expenditure was significantly increased as you know at the time. Uh, we uh, had a step up that was already happening, right? So as I said earlier, the, and the original step up was announced in 2016 and then the white paper and then uh, Prime Minister Morrison again stepping up the step up. But one of the important things from day one has been cooperation between us. The reason it's so important to cooperate is to maximise the effectiveness of what we're doing. So for example, uh, if we're working in a particular country uh, and there's an opportunity for us to partner together on a particular priority for that country, then that's something we should, we should look to do and we should work cooperatively together. The two foreign ministers meet twice a year together and of course discussion occurs on our development uh, within the region and what's what, what we're doing collectively together. So the answer is, did we develop them together? No, we didn't. Are we working closely, cooperatively <coughs> together to implement them? Yes, we are. Anna? Thanks, James. Um, kia ora, uh, you and uh, Anne Bowles from Mass Hi. University Hi, in New Anna. Zealand. Um, a key theme of this workshop has been how the Pacific fits into the Indo-Pacific. So what I would be interested to know is how will the Office of the Pacific support and amplify Pacific voices within the broad Indo-Pacific architecture across those multilateral um, fora and, and more broadly? Yeah, so, so thanks for the question. Nice to, to have you here. Um, look, we will continue, and I think we have a good track record in amplifying the Pacific's voice in multilateral settings. So one of the things with the establishment of the office is that you know the work that I am doing is not, I think this is an important aspect of the role, it's, it's not just DFAT, right? so I'm working, I'm working right across uh, Australian government, so that enables us to click into those and get a, a common understanding uh, of the Pacific step up on what we're doing and a common coordination of that. And then within multilateral uh, settings to advocate for those priorities. Uh, so that, that's the way we've always done it. That's the way we'll continue to do it. Of course, New Zealand's a key part of those multilateral institutions, etc. So we need to work collectively. In the past, I've certainly worked closely, for example, with Japan and others in those settings. So, so that will continue. We will continue to advocate very strongly for the Pacific's Pacific region in those forums. Yep, boys. Hi, Wes Morgan uh, with the University of the South Pacific and uh, more recently with the Griffith Asia Institute. Uh, you mentioned the Boy Declaration and, and that the Boy Declaration uh, uh, reaffirms climate change as the single greatest threat to Pacific Island countries. But the Boy Declaration also reaffirms a commitment to progressing implementation of the Paris Agreement. And we heard yesterday that the Paris Agreement <coughs> is the first and last line of defence for Pacific Island countries. So I just wondered if you could talk a bit about how Australia is helping to progress implementation of the Paris Agreement. Yeah, and certainly I think um, the Prime Minister has been very clear on this. We are, um, we are part of the Paris Agreement, we'll implement those commitments and we've made that clear uh, throughout the Pacific and, and elsewhere. The way we're helping uh, Pacific countries implement that, and I went to the, uh, the CAP uh, that was held in Fiji, the Climate Action for the Pacific, a week or two ago, and uh, the Prime Minister in Fiji, Prime Minister talked about Australia's efforts around uh, the NDCs, the implementation of nationally determined contributions, uh, and our, our support for that event. But also, I think the, the funding, the climate finance funding that's being put into the region uh, of $300 million over the four years is having a big impact in terms of some of the adaptation work that countries are now implementing and have seen uh, on the travels that I've done. So in terms of that support for Pacific Island countries, in terms of implementing their priorities around climate, Australia is certainly doing that. 
in terms of honouring our commitments, broader commitments to the Paris Agreement. Very clear that we are we are signed up to that. We are implementing that in Australia. Um, so we are we are totally supportive uh, of both of those. <coughs> Sorry, that's good. Good morning, uh, George uh, from Department of Pacific Affairs. Hi, George. Uh, I'm looking forward to the forum later this year uh, and the policy announcements that will be made. As much as uh, you can comment on what they are, or will there be a change <laughs> of what's going to come? George, he's trying to get rid of the head of the office already. <laughs> hey? um, uh, look, um, the only thing I will say, George, is I have, um, uh, there's a couple of bits, you know, we are looking forward to it being held in Hunafuki. I think um, it's a big thing for, for the country and as I said earlier, I've been there three times and I know the Prime Minister very well and he's very much looking forward to the event. Uh, so part of it is, is the event itself. The second bit is around the agenda that's obviously driven by the PIF Secretariat with the Pacific leaders. That's still being developed and the policy uh, work around that. There is uh, indications around the draft sort of agenda that's being put together. It will obviously uh, have aspects around climate, uh, that we, which uh, won't surprise anybody. And then of course, uh, other policy areas that are important to the Pacific countries uh, at this time to have discussion on, but I can't sort of outline the detail of those today. Just down there. Michelle? Oh, I'm sorry. There's one in the front here, yeah. Let's go down in the front and then we'll go back up. Uh, hi, I'm James Cox. I'm from a small peace building NGO called Pacifica. Um, and my question relates to Bougainville, which uh, is probably the most pressing immediate peace and security issue in, in, in the region. Um, and it's a short question like that. So what is the role of the Office of the Pacific in Australia's response to Bougainville? And perhaps in that you might illustrate a little bit more practically about how the Office is going to be working across other parts of government and so on, because that is not very clear so. Okay, um, so I'll start off with the second question. So, uh, the Office of the Pacific, uh, one of the things we've done is try and build secondees and transferees in from other agencies. And as I said earlier, we've got 10 now in the, the office and there'll be more. So what that provides is a direct link back into those agencies. It also provides the opportunity to identify where there are opportunities. Um, uh, so that's, that's part of that whole of government. The other is working across the whole of government architecture. So I uh, spend time in different agencies um, at a senior level, talking about their implementation of different initiatives in the Pacific. And of course, we collectively feed into how things are going around our step up and the like and whether we're achieving what we need to. So those discussions are occurring both through a formal cross-agency sort of setup, uh, and I'll be chairing, for example, uh, a cross-agency band three um, forum. There are also mechanisms at band two level, division head level that are also happening, which is about holding everyone to account and being and sharing information on what we're all doing in relation to the Pacific. And of course, it's not just the core agencies we all think about. Uh, Australian government are doing a lot of work with a lot of agencies that people don't think about. For example, you know, the Bureau is working with, uh, with, with Pacific countries on some of, the, some of those as aspects. So that's, that's sort of the way the whole of government is working and we're looking to enhance coordination. And when I go and do senior officer discussions out in countries, like I'm doing uh, you know, from time to time, I'll take a cross, a cross group, not just a DFAC group with me. Um, the other bit on Bougainville, of course, that's an important uh, issue coming up. So the referendums, as you know, coming up in October and there's a process in place for that. Um, and of course, where we've got um, uh, the former Island Prime Minister, who's facilitating over the top of that referendum. 
and of course we'll see how that uh, plays out. We are Australia is providing development assistance, of course, uh, into to Bougainville as well, and of course we have regular dialogue uh, on that issue as we head up to the referendum itself. So it's still primarily with sort of the, the PNG desks, the Bougainville desks in the and, and so on. Well, I think, uh, you know, this is a matter for Bougainville and everything. The, the, the referendum itself and what was agreed uh, 20 years ago around what process would be used at this time. Uh, it's, not, it's not for Australia to, to dictate that. Um, and then, you know, as I said, there's a process that's underway and, um, and we're, we're obviously watching it closely like other people are. All right, we've probably got time for one more. Because I'm conscious of like Senate estimates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Only more difficult than <laughs> penetrating. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. Hi. My name is Michelle Rooney. I'm a research fellow here at the Australian National University. Um, my, I'll probably leave it like a plea rather than a question. My, my, um, my, my plea relates to the intersection between gender and these narratives of security um, in the Pacific and Australia also. And you mentioned in your talk that gender inequality is one of the key issues in the Pacific region and, and a key area for your focus. So my plea is, in these intersections between security narratives in the Pacific, in Australia, that, that also cut across government, Australian government and other in the Pacific Island governments, the plea is if you could keep right on top of the agenda the gendered implications of all these narratives, especially in local communities in the Pacific. And um, my, my specific example relates to Manus Island, because that's the place I know best, and I write into that space. And, and sort of just putting that on the table as a key issue, I, I think it's really important, because in many ways, we, run, we already have risk, I, uh, in my opinion, and we run the risk of continuing to undermine Australia's great work in security and gender in the Pacific by not giving due attention to these issues. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Michelle. I mean, I can only reinforce how important, uh, and I can assure you, gender will be front and centre in the work from my point of view. Um, women and girls, um, so I can only assure you that that's front and centre in my mind. Um, thank you so much for coming along this morning um, and providing those very insightful comments. Please uh, join me in thanking you.